My miter saw station build was one of the earliest woodworking projects on this channel and was by far the largest project I had undertaken at that point. And this miter saw station is based on Jay Bates's very popular design and it served me really well over the last four years. That said, I never really got it set back up properly after I moved into my new shop about a year ago. And after receiving this beast of a new miter saw from Jet a few weeks ago, I decided it was finally time to give the miter saw station a little love and give it a few upgrades. These upgrades included adding a T-Track stop block system for making more accurate repeatable cuts, adding some removable panels to the saw opening to improve the dust collection, and finally making a zero clearance insert plate for the new Jet miter saw. I got started by working on getting some T-Track added to the work surface, and this was a fairly straightforward process of routing a few grooves to house the T-Track pieces. I used an edge guide to ensure I had a nice straight groove, and I did have to remove the maple trim on this left side before routing. I really snuck up on my depth here and got to my final depth after about three passes and ended up with a really nice snug fit with the T-Track just below the surface of the plywood. I repeated the same process on the right half of the miter saw station, although I don't really see myself using a stop block a bunch on this side, but I figured I might as well install it while I was at it. And then I could route another groove for the peel and stick measuring tape. This tape, which I got from Rockler, is actually made of metal and is just thick enough to catch on boards as I slide them across the work surface, and I figured housing the tape in a shallow groove would also help the numbers keep from being worn off over time. I initially routed the groove for the tape measure right next to the groove for the T-Track, but I realized this wasn't actually going to work with the stop block design I was planning to use. Because of this, I needed to reroute the groove, this time routing it about an inch and a half from the T-Track groove, and that extra groove wasn't really a problem as it was shallow enough where it wouldn't cause any issues. Once again, I repeated the process on the right half of the miter saw station and also cleaned up that maple trim while I was at it, which had really seen better days, and I used my low angle jack plane for this. When I went to install the T-Track, I realized I had actually mistakenly ordered the wrong type of T-Track from Rockler, which is where I get all my T-Track, and I had received pieces with no holes pre-drilled. Because of this, I needed to drill holes for my mounting screws and also countersink the holes so the screw heads would sit flush with the surface of the T-Track. Since there wasn't a ton of plywood left for the screws to thread into after routing the grooves for the T-Track, I decided to add a little bit more strength to the connection by adding some CA glue to the grooves before screwing down the T-Track, and this made for a rock solid bond. By the way, in case you've never worked with it before, T-Track, which is generally made of aluminum, cuts really easily with standard woodworking tools, and I just used my miter saw to cut the T-Track pieces to length. I added the rest of the pieces to the left and right sides of the miter saw station, and then I could get to work on some custom stop blocks. I decided to go ahead and make two stop blocks while I was at it just to have a backup on hand, and I made them from some scrap pieces of 3 quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. I also needed a runner for each of the stop blocks to keep the stop blocks square to the T-Track, so I cut a few runners from the offcut from the stop block pieces. And I snuck up on the width of these pieces until I had a nice snug fit in the T-Track. Next, I cut a groove on the underside of the stop blocks to house the runners, and I again snuck up on this fit as I wanted it pretty snug. I also flipped the pieces around 180 degrees on each pass to keep the groove perfectly centered on the bottom of the stop blocks. Once I had the groove cut, I could give the stop blocks a thorough sanding to knock off any sharp edges, and I also beveled the bottom edge of the front face of the stop block to help keep bits of sawdust from throwing off the measurements of the stop block when I'm cutting pieces later. After sanding, I glued the runners in place, and I used a pretty minimal amount of glue here just to avoid a ton of squeeze out. Once the glue dried, I needed to lay out locations for the T-slot bolts, which is how the stop blocks will lock onto the T-track, and I center punched these hole locations and then drilled the holes at the drill press, confirming the fit was good after drilling the holes. Next, I needed to notch out the runner where it intersected with the T-slot bolt so that the bolt could tighten onto the T-track. And I marked out this area and then used a chisel to remove the excess material. And man, chiseling plywood is so satisfying as it usually comes off in almost perfect layers, especially this Baltic birch, and I was left with a super clean notch. 
With that, I could test the stop block on the T-Track and it worked perfectly, really smooth to slide back and forth and it locked into place extremely securely. Now that I had a working stop block, I could get the peel and stick tape measure located and added permanently. I lined up the tape measure with where I wanted to mount the acrylic hairline indicator I'd be using to read the measurements, and then it was as simple as peeling off the backing and sticking the tape measure in place. And as I mentioned, this tape measure is made of steel, so it did take a little force to cut, but I consider this a good thing as it should be extremely durable over time. After cutting the tape measure flush with the work surface, I filed down the sharp edges and then I could get the indicator mounted to the stop block. To do this, I used something with a known length, a 36 inch long straight edge in my case, and then I butted the stop block up to that straight edge, locked it down, and then stuck the indicator in place so that it lined up with the 36 inch measurement on the tape measure. After attaching the indicator, I could make a test cut to confirm the stop block's accuracy and it was dead on. Now I of course decided to change the blade on the miter saw after I dialed in the stop block, which of course threw off the measurement, and so I ended up drilling out a slot in the indicator so that I can make fine adjustments like these in the future if needed. With that, the T-Track stop block system was working great, so next I could work on the panels for the front of the opening, which again will help to focus the dust collection airflow around the blade. Basically this process is pretty simple, it's just a lot of trial and error trying to get a piece that will fit the opening nicely without leaving too much space around the saw, and I actually ended up attaching a few scrap pieces together to get the shape I was looking for. And after getting the fit for the upper section dialed in, I realized there was really more space I could cover up in that lower section, so I added another scrap piece to fill that in off camera, and then I could figure out how to mount these panels. And the panels need to be easily removable, and after some thought, it seemed like magnets were the most logical mounting solution. First, I held the panels in place and drilled some small pilot holes to mark the magnet locations on both the miter saw station and the panels themselves. And then I came back with a 3 quarter inch Forstner bit to drill the recesses for the magnets. I attached the magnets in the recesses using CA glue, using a little activator to lock them in place instantly and then I could drill out the corresponding holes on the back side of the panels at the drill press. And I really wanted a good seal between the panels and the miter saw station, so I knew I wanted the magnets to be flush, and luckily the quarter inch plywood I used for the panels was just deep enough to house these magnets. Once again, I attached the magnets to the panels using CA glue, and I also made sure the magnets were in the correct orientation so that they would actually stick to the magnets on the miter saw station. With that, the panels were done and I could test how well they worked and I was pretty impressed with how much of an improvement they made to the dust collection on the miter saw. The magnets make the panels really easy to remove and reinstall and I think this is a must for anyone with a similar style of miter saw hood. I can't believe I've put it off for this long. The last thing I wanted to do to really get this miter saw station and specifically this new jet miter saw dialed in was to make a zero clearance insert plate for the miter saw. First, I removed the existing inserts, which are extremely wide to accommodate the full range of bevel angles the saw is capable of cutting. And next, using a set of calipers, I measured the thickness the insert plate needed to be, which was a hair under a quarter of an inch on this saw. And I also measured the length and width of the opening with a tape measure while I was at it. Since the opening was just under a quarter of an inch, I could use a scrap piece of quarter inch plywood for the insert, but first I needed to figure out which type of quarter inch plywood would work because of course they all varied slightly in thickness. For example, the quarter inch pure bond plywood I had on hand was just a bit too thin, but luckily the quarter inch Baltic birch plywood I had was just a hair thicker than I needed and could easily be taken down to final thickness at the drum sander later. I cut the insert to rough width at the table saw, really sneaking up on the fit. And then I could cut it to length with the miter saw. And I did need to use a backer board here to bridge that opening where the insert plate would have been. With the length and width looking good, next I needed to shave off the corners a bit to match the original inserts. And I traced the outline of the corners of the original inserts onto the new inserts, and then sanded away these areas using my oscillating belt sander, which made really quick work of this. Once that was done, I could test fit the insert and it fit great, except it was, as I mentioned, just a hair too thick. 
To remedy this, I used my trusty Powermatic drum sander to get the piece down to exact thickness, but honestly, a random orbit sander probably would have worked here if you don't have a drum sander. That said, if you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. I snuck up on the thickness, making multiple passes at the drum sander until the insert was perfectly flush with the bed of the miter saw, and then I could finish it up by drilling and countersinking some mounting holes. Once again, I used the original inserts as templates and center punched the hole locations, then drilled the holes and countersunk them at the drill press. Finally, I could get the new zero clearance insert plate installed on the miter saw using the original bolts, which did require a little finagling as my holes were just slightly off, but once I had the insert secured in place, I could make the initial cut with my fresh blade to establish the curve. And I'm really happy I knocked this little project out right after getting this new jet miter saw set up, as the zero clearance insert not only helps to drastically reduce tear out, but it also gives me an extremely accurate reference for where the blade is going to meet up with my workpiece in case I'm not using the stop lock. Anyway, with that, I could get the miter saw station tidied up a little bit more, and then I could call this project complete. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one and maybe this gave you some ideas for your miter saw station. I am really glad I finally got this done and my miter saw is gonna be a lot more useful here in my shop. If you guys wanna learn more about the tools and materials I used in this video, I'll have links to those down in the video description as always. Also wanna say a huge shout out to my YouTube members who I'll be listing here on the screen. Uh, they get all kinds of awesome behind the scenes perks. If you guys are interested in checking that out, I'll have a link to that somewhere on the screen as well. And last, while you're here, why not go ahead and get subscribed, ring that little notification bell and watch this video of mine that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. All right, thanks for watching everybody and until next week, happy building.